Hello friends from Cinco Razones and welcome back for this time for the first show of the Black and Pink show. That's right. We're going to be doing this with Austin Robillard to talk about the Inter Miami, the new guys in town, the sixth reason as uh, Austin called them to because that's the sixth professional uh, sport that we have here in Miami that uh, Five Reasons Sports is going to be covering doing this uh, type of podcast. So welcome, Austin, and welcome, everybody, to the Black and Pink Show, episode one. Yeah, man, happy to be here. Finally get to do uh, our own little gig on Inter-Miami. Season's coming around the corner, so it should be really exciting. And all the fans, everybody listening has a lot to look forward to. We'll be putting out a bunch of content uh, throughout the season, and it should be fun. Yeah, it should be fun. And talking about fun and talking about the season coming up, we were talking about the players that could be coming to Inter Miami. No Cavani, no Silva so far, no Messi, no Cristiano. But we had David Beckham, David Beckham talking to Neymar in a weird interview. Was it fun? Was it weird? It was, uh, I don't know. I mean, Neymar, obviously we all love Beckham. He was a great player. Neymar loves him. But when... When Beckham told him, hey, you're coming to Miami, and Neymar was, yeah, that's a good joke, and maybe in 10 years. So what, <laughs> what did you like about the interview? Oh, man. It, I mean, it was just good fun to watch. They were, they were admiring each other. They, they yeah. were talking about each other, and, you know, whether it was on the pitch or when it came to fashion, they're both, you know, high fashion. Yeah, icons, right. They talk more about fashion than I soccer. Know. <laughs> it was funny. But then out of nowhere, you, you see a handshake deal, basically, of Neymar saying, yeah, I'll come to Inter Miami, and Beckham was like, okay, I'm going to make you sign a blank contract and that's for Inter Miami <laughs> the next couple of years. And they shook hands and I was like, wow, I mean, okay, I'll take Neymar any day. So, yeah, yeah. We were talking, yeah, we were talking about superstars. Obviously, Neymar is not going to come, but uh, hopefully we have somebody that's uh, some sort of a similar profile than Neymar. Like, as a good player, obviously he's going to be older in a different stage of the career, but maybe a, a good player like Neymar could be uh, bringing a lot of joy to Miami. Uh, yeah, I mean, Not necessarily, I mean, Neymar, yeah, we won't be here for a couple of years at, yeah. if he comes ever, but yes. you don't want to get your hopes up. But we did finally get a name, Alejandro. Okay, what I, is it? What is it? So it's a, the Mexican, as you said last time. Yeah, right? that I said last time on the okay. other. Okay, Rodolfo okay. Pizarro. The Rodolfo one, Pizarro. Well, he's now in Monterrey in the Liga MX. And what happened? He sat out uh, during so, the last game. So that means that he's coming to Miami. Is that what you're saying? I, I, that's what I saw. I, I've seen a couple reports, uh, both from ESPN and the athletic. So when it comes to soccer media, you know, there's not a lot you can trust, but when it comes down yeah, to the I athletic know. and ESPN, those are two pretty high profile sources. And they said yeah. that, um, so last night Monterey had a game and in the Copa MX and he wasn't in the 18 man roster. He, they took him out. Mm -hmm. And now it is said that after all the complications with the transfer fee, Uh, McDonough and the club have and Monterey have finally decided on a fee and I, what I've heard what I saw in the athletic report and their article is that it is um, just shy of 12 million US dollars and we will retain a hundred percent of the rights to Rodolfo Pizarro so if we were to sign him later on or, or release him later on and he gets signed by another club we gain all of the money um, they were working out a lot of different stuff like Monterey wanted 17 million at one point or 20 million at one point. Um, and then McDonough wanted to do 10 million. So they finally settled on 12 million of just about and a hundred percent rights to Rodolfo. I think the other option was uh, about $10 million dollars and 80% of the rights to Rodolfo. So um, he should be coming in the next couple of days. So look out for that announcement and look for him to slot right into the number 10 role. Yeah. And it makes sense because having the head coach coming from Monterey now bringing Uh, the star player from that team makes makes a lot of sense. So hopefully we'll have Rodolfo Pizarro here with Inter Miami soon. But now, since last time we did the starting 11, the Austin Robillard starting 11 for Inter Miami, but we didn't have Pizarro in it. So we're, I'm going to give you another shot, Austin. All right. So okay. think about it again. Who will be your starting 11 now with Pizarro in the roster? All right. So we're going to start up top and we have to talk about an injury later on but I'm going to be changing my striker uh, to Jerome Kiesewetter. So we'll start Ooh. up top with Jerome Kiesewetter. Yes, that, that's a report that you have in a, in a couple of minutes, but keep going. Then number 10 it'll, in the central attacking midfield role is going to be Pizarro. Mm -hmm. On the left, we'll have Pellegrini. Okay. On the right, we'll be looking to have Lewis Morgan, who actually just got a flight from Scotland today. 
and she'll be landing in Miami and just getting ready to train with yes. the team. So that's good news. Okay, we're, we're recording this on a Wednesday. Wednesday, February the yes. 12th. So today he got here. Okay. Um, and then our two central defensive midfielders will be Will Trapp and Victor Ujoa. Okay. And then at left back, we'll have Ben Sweat. The two center backs are going to be Nico Figal and Roman Torres. Our right back will be Alvis Powell. Okay. Jamaica. And, and, and the goalie. The goalie, experience. the number one, will be the experienced guy, Louis Robles. There you go. Louis Robles, that will be the starting 11 for Austin Robular now with uh, Pizarro in the team. And talking about the goalkeepers and all the players that you just mentioned, you had the opportunity to go to the uh, uh, Tuesday practice, Tuesday uh, training over there with Inter Miami. What, what did you see over there? So I, I got to see a lot. And, I mean, for the, the limited media access that we got, I mean – And yeah, welcome, to welcome to welcome to the stage. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, hey, man, you got to take what you can get at this point, right? Yeah, I mean that's um, it. So, but we gained information. Uh, at least I did. So, um, I first walked in, and training was just about getting ready to to start. Um, I saw Alonzo. All the players were together. Uh, it seemed very much in unison, which is good to see. Uh, everybody was getting along, and it was intense training from Alonzo. Uh, Diego Alonzo, he's really getting on them, even for the small media access, the little show that they put on for us. He was clapping. He was yelling. He was telling players to come on, calling them by their first names, tell them to hurry up, stuff like that. That was good to see. But off to the side of that, on a whole different uh, pitch, was Louis Robles and John McCarthy. Um, most likely, that, that told me that that's going to be the number one and number two keepers because um, there were other keepers on the pitch um, with all the other the other squad. But on a whole separate pitch, there was a goalkeeper coach, Louis Robles and John McCarthy working on their footwork. Um, from what I saw, I, I was on my way out when I saw them. But um, so maybe that almost confirms that I'm right about at least one so far. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I think well, those two are going to be the number one and number two, and they'll be in the squad every single week, um, barring an injury or anything like that. But um, yeah, so that I saw that. Um, I think today they closed off a scrimmage uh, with NYCFC. I think NYCFC was training in Boca for the last couple of days, and then they scrimmaged down at Lockhart, but it was completely closed off. So didn't get to see that. Um, but also at that Tuesday practice, it was reported that Carranza is going to be out for 10 to 12 weeks. Um, so not, three months out. Yeah, just about three months. They, Paul McDonough stated that, Starting January 31st, you'll, they're going to give him 10 weeks. And, ah, oh man, for one, our, for one of our most major signings, uh, it sucks because we, we wanted to see him at the number nine role to start off the, see, start off the year. But uh, we won't get to see it for at least three months. And that's where I start to talk about Keith Vetter being in that number nine role up top, and that's why he's in my starting XI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you bring him out. So he's going to be the next option for Inter Miami or one of the options there for Inter Miami. Uh, that's if if they don't bring anybody else, right? But so far, it's going to be probably Jerome Kisivetter uh, playing there as a forward for, I mean, at least the first three months of the season, I guess, yeah. until we get uh, Carranza back. But to talk about Kisivetter, this guy that comes from playing at El Paso Loc Locomotive, Uh, locomotive. I got it right at this time. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be talking to Phil Backy, who's the host of the podcast Seriously Loco. He's going to give us an idea of uh, who is this Jerome Kisavera guy, because we, we, we were expecting superstars, Cavani, uh, Silva, maybe, I don't know, maybe Messi gets tired of Barcelona and comes to Miami. Maybe Cristiano Ronaldo gets tired of Juventus and all the European problems over there and comes to Barcelona. Maybe Falcao, maybe James in Madrid, who's not playing a lot. But no, we, got, we have this guy, Jerome Kisvetter. So let's, let's see or let's listen. Let's hear from somebody that got him, that got to watch him a lot. And, and you did. You watched him too, Austin. And so let's, let's have... Uh, Phil Backy now, and let's enjoy what he has to say about Jerome Kisvetter. And now, since we were talking about uh, forwards on the team and who might be taking the place of Carranza, who's now injured, uh, we are bringing a uh, guest to our podcast today, and he's Phil Backy from the podcast Seriously 
loco, seriously loco, from El Paso, the, uh, the podcast that follows the El Paso lo Locomotive, how do you say Locomotive in English? Locomotive. Yeah, locomotive. Locomotive, there you go. So El Paso Locomotive. And so, Phil, thank you for coming and welcome to our edition of uh, Pink and Black, Black and Pink. I don't know. We don't know yet, Austin, but uh, uh, welcome, Phil. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm, I'm uh, excited to be able to talk about a guy who was so important for us last season. Important indeed. Um, uh, Jerome's, a little background on Jerome uh, and why we're so big on him now, you know, because he might step into that starting role. He was a leading goal scorer for El Paso Locomotive. He had 12 goals during the USL season um, and in about 25 game played, games played. And he had an uh, injury during the season, too. He missed a lot of time. Um, so, yeah, Phil, we got a couple questions for you when it comes to Keith Spitter. We want to get to know him a little bit um, since you guys were close with him. Um, and the first question is, uh, how important was he to you? And do you think that that importance can translate over to Inter Miami? Yeah, I mean, he was, I mean, it, it's really hard to overstate how, how important he was last season for us just because he did change uh, so much about how the team played and how the team uh, was able to play. His, uh, his ability uh, in front of goal really – we were we were struggling before he came in to score goals um and so he came came in um you know we had primarily seen in the past with whether it was with the US men's national team or with the uh with teams in Germany we had primarily seen him on the wing so um the his ability to play as a center forward was something that i hadn't really seen up to this point and it was something that really surprised me in a good way he uh, he he fit right into the team. He went on a, a goal scoring tear about four games into the season. It took him to adapt. I think now that he spent um, you know let most of last season and now this off season in in the states and training with uh, with Miami. I think I think he can slot right into the team. Honestly, it's just a matter of um, staying healthy. And the injury did set him back a little bit last season and then I think towards the end of the season he had uh he had the agreement with Miami kind of in place so I think towards the end of last season he did fall off a little bit just because he was kind of preparing for the next for the next phase of his career and um and wanted to stay healthy for it so maybe he didn't quite um you know run out every single ball or, or anything like that but he, he scored some really important goals for us last season and really changed just the feeling around the team and, and helped us, you know, to that eventual uh, Western Conference final uh, finish. Uh, Phil, uh, talk to us about the person. Who's Jerome Kizivetter besides being a great forward and a guy that can score a lot of goals? But talk to uh, our people in Miami about this guy. Who's him and what he meant to the community uh, down there in El Paso? Yeah, Jerome's a very uh, I would I would say he's kind of the strong uh, the strong silent type. He's not he's not a very um, a very big personality or anything like that. He's just he's very much like a business oriented guy. He he uh, he likes to spend time with his family a lot, and and he's just very much like focused on doing his job. He's he's not really big into being in the spotlight. So it'll be interesting to see how he kind of adapts to, to th life down in Miami and at a higher level with MLS, you know, there's likely going to be more attention and more, uh, more um, kind of scrutiny, especially if he's starting for you guys. Um, it's going to be uh, a little bit of a difference for him, I think, but he's used to playing for, for big clubs in, in Germany as well. So um, yeah, he's just very, he's a very strong character. I think he's, he's good to have around a team because he is such a hard worker. Um, but he's definitely, um, yeah, he's definitely one of those guys who just shows up to training every day and he's going to, you know, he's going to give a hundred percent because he, he really is, um, you know, this, this now, I think being, being at the MLS level, it, it's a chance for him to, to show on an even bigger stage, um, what, what he can do and he's going to, he's going to do his, his best to do that. So I think, um, I think you guys have gotten a, a very, uh, just a very good person as well as a, a quality player. Phil, do you think that him being, you know, coming from El Paso, which was an expansion team out there, to moving to yet another expansion team, does that experience, you think, give him an edge over a couple of the other strikers that we have in the team that he might have to, you know, battle against to get the starting spot? 
I think, I think it could be an advantage. Um, I, it's interesting, you know, expansion teams can be such a wild card. Um, and I think, I think many of us in El Paso, we weren't, you know, really sure how the group would gel. And it was really after, really after the addition of Jerome that, um, kind of added that spark up front that, that turned last year's team into what it was. Um, I think, I think, I mean, he definitely will kind of know his way around how to navigate um, an uncertain squad um, as it kind of was when he came in in El Paso. But I think it's a little bit different because obviously Miami have added a lot of quality um, across the team. And um, he is, you know, in El Paso, he was brought in and and he kind of knew that he would be um, one of the, you know, one of the first names on the team sheet each each match. And I think now it's – you know, maybe a little closer to his experience in Germany where he knows he's going to have to, to, to fight and scratch and claw for a spot in the starting 11. Um, just because it is, you know, it's a, it's a, a top tier squad and it's something that that's been assembled with, you know, a lot more uh, resources than, than what we have down here in El Paso. So um, it, it, it will be interesting to see if he can adapt. Cause I think, for, even though they're both expansion teams, I think this is uh, probably a, quite a different um, experience coming into a, an expansion team in MLS versus USO. All right, Phil, we're talking to Phil ba uh, Baki from Seriously Loco, uh, a podcast that follows the El Paso locomotive. But then, uh, Phil, we ha we've had a lot of rumors here in Miami, you know, maybe Cavani was coming, then Silva, and then, but, but by now, we, we, we haven't really had that really big player we're going to be talking about it in the next weeks uh, who's going to be coming but the one that's here it's Jerome Kisevetter what would you say to those fans here in Miami about this forward and how may he, he he's probably not going to be the superstar of the team but he's going to be that player that's going to be scoring goals uh, or, or a ton of goals hopefully this season but what would you say to the fans here in Miami what to expect from him Yeah, he he thrives on um, his instincts. I guess um, he's he's a very he's a very uh, he's a forward who primarily likes to receive the ball um, to his feet or to his head, you know, near the penalty spot. Uh, and he likes he likes a first time finish. He likes to try to to strike the ball on the volley or or guide at home maybe maybe you know a uh, even a back heel every once in a while he uh his his style in front of goal is very much um driven by the service and that was why our um left back last season James Kiffey ended the season with with eight assists and I believe five of them were for Kisa Vetter um and it was it was a big connection to get the fullbacks and the wingers involved and, and be able to, to have them provide those balls into the box for, for Jerome to latch onto. He loves, he loves to get in front of goal and kind of use just his, his innate ability and, and instincts um, to make those runs that, uh, you know, get him away from defenders and, and get him in good goal scoring uh, positions. His, he, he scored a couple of goals um, where he, you know, received the ball further out and, and actually dribbled into the box. And that is something that else that he has, he does have in his locker. But I'd say primarily, you know, he's he's very much kind of a, or he was for us anyways, very much kind of a poacher in front of, in front of goal and thrived off of that service from from elsewhere in the team. So um, he he makes good runs in behind, but uh, you know he's not going to be beating a, a ton of people off the dribble or anything like that. But he is going to get into good goal scoring positions. And uh, if you know if you guys have that quality. Um, to get him the ball in those positions, he is he is lethal from uh, from you know, within the 18 yard box. He was pretty lethal against uh, Tulsa. I don't know if you're. I'm sure you do remember one of the most memorable games when I was out there with you guys down two 0 and he scored a minute after just one of those poacher goals came from the wing on the left side and ties the game two two in the 81st minute. It's exactly what he does. You're exactly right, Phil. That game was crazy, and that's what really you know put my mind on to Kisa Vetter like wow you know he's that guy so much passion and so much drive and exactly he's a poacher in front of goal he got the ball from the left wing on the penalty spot basically one tapped it in and it was a beautiful finish and it was it was a great game yeah that and that is that you witnessing that goal I think is good because it does you know that's more or less how how he's going to get most of his goals and 
Um, and I think, you know, being in a team surrounded with quality, um, it, he's going to have opportunities to score and he doesn't waste many of them. So, um, so I think you've got a guy who, you know, his return was, you know, one, one and two, what, you know, a goal every two games basically over the course of the season. But um, when he's in form, he can, he can provide, you know, one or two goals a game. And, and he's just, when he's in form, he's, he's pretty unstoppable, uh, at least at USL level. So we'll see if he can carry that over to, to the top tier. Yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope so. All right, Phil. Well, thank you for being with us, uh, giving us an idea of who Jerome Kisivera is going to be. And hopefully we'll be talking uh, to you soon, back again. And hopefully after he scored at least 5, 10, 15 goals this season for Inter Miami. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> hey, thank you guys for having me. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. And uh, yeah, I hope, I hope uh, for Jerome's sake he has a, a great season. Phil, before you go, uh, where can people find you? Yeah, so um, if they're interested in, in lower league American soccer, U, uh, USL, um, at Seriously Loco is, is the podcast. So we're actually going to record a new episode tonight um, talking about preseason and, and all of that. So um, if you're interested at all in, in the lower leagues, you can check that out. And then you can find my, uh, my personal account is uh, at Baki Balboa. That's B A K I. Um, what a name! Because I made it. I made it in high school, and uh, you know. Hey, it's uh, a fun name. I like it. Stuck around, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Thank, Thank you, you guys.